Good afternoon, everyone. Bienvenidos. Welcome. My name is Bianca Sianos, and I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study and Distinguished McKnight University Professor of American Studies. For access purposes, I'm a brown-skinned woman with dark hair, wearing glasses with black frames and a light brown sweater. The University of Minnesota Spotlight Series is a collaborative partnership between the Institute for Advanced Study and Northrop to present lectures, conversations, performances, and exhibits, and other events around timely topics of interest throughout the academic year. This year's series focuses on racial and social justice. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our very first event of the spring semester, Strings of Resilience, a puppetry celebration. We're also very grateful to the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Change for your, for your sponsorship for this event. All IAS public events, including this one, include professional captioning. You can view captions by clicking the stream text link to share via the chat, or by clicking the show captions button in Zoom's menu. We'll be using Slido to facilitate Q&A today. When it's time for Q&A, we will display a QR code on the screen. Alternatively, you can use your smartphone and go to www.slido.com and enter the code hashtag spotlight series. Please note that questions can be submitted anonymously and that in order to respond to as many questions as possible, we may occasionally combine related questions. My next step in welcoming you today is to remind us that wherever you are joining us from today, you are on native land. I'm speaking from the ancestral and contemporary lands of Dakota people. I would also like to remind us that the University of Minnesota was not only built on unceded Dakota land, but also built with the profits from selling thousands of acres of Dakota and Anishinaabe land. At the IAS, we see the work of supporting communities of color as inseparable from supporting our indigenous relatives and colleagues. Toward that end, it is important to acknowledge and denounce the historic and contemporary forms of racial injustice that take place in the city where we work and live as well. So I begin by standing in solidarity with the families of George Floyd, Dante Wright, Jamar Clark, Philando Castile, and many others whose loved ones have been killed by police violence in Minnesota. And as a scholar whose work critically examines racial injustice, I also wish to acknowledge and affirm the sovereignty of our indigenous relatives while advancing the IS's commitment to building an anti-racist and inclusive university that disavows white supremacy and racism. As you join us at future Spotlight events and in just a series of events, I hope you'll see how these conversations act as just one way we have committed to working alongside our relatives to dismantling systems that harm our communities and also to building a just university together. And now without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce today's guests. Steve Ackerman oversees main stage programming and community partnerships for the In the Heart of the Beast Puppet and Mass Theater. He is a playwright and puppet artist who focuses on quick, crude, high energy art making. Sofia Padilla is a Mexican theater artist, director, designer, and puppeteer who has participated in over 40 national and international theater productions and toured around the world. Currently, she teaches puppetry at McAllister College, works as a summer staff member of Bread and Puppet Theater, as the artistic co-director of Paradox Teatro, which she founded in 2017 with Davy Steinman, and as co-director of Puppet Lab at Open Eye Theater. Chimandika Wanduragala is a Sri Lankan American puppet artist, filmmaker, DJ, and now exploring sound design. She loves transporting people to another world through puppetry and sharing the sense of joy and magic that comes with bringing a puppet to life. Wanduragala is a founder and executive plus artistic director of Monkey Bar's Harmelodic Workshop, which supports native black IPOC in developing creative and technical skills in contemporary puppetry. Juan Vu is a puppeteer, educator, and community organizer. As a second generation Vietnamese American, she uses humor and the playfulness of puppetry to tell stories of healing for herself and her community. She got her start in puppetry through Monkey Bear's Harmelodic Workshop and is now the Puppet, co -la Puppet Lab co-artistic director at Open Eye Theater. Her first length, full-length puppet show, Phantom Loss, premieres this spring 2024 at In the Heart of the Beast Theater. Finally, our moderator for today is Kristen Brogdon. Kristen is Director of Artistic and Community Programs for Northrop at the University of Minnesota. She curates Northrop's dance, music, and film series, and leads the organization's artistic vision and planning. We're so grateful to partner with Kristen on programming the Spotlight series. So I want to thank all of these um, spe wonderful speakers for joining us today. Please join me in giving them a very warm welcome. And Kristen, the stage is yours. Thank you, Bianette, and welcome to our panelists. 
I'm happy to be here in conversation with several members of our Minnesota and Twin Cities puppetry community. I myself am not a puppeteer, but I am enchanted with puppets. And my first foray into this world was producing a collaborative dance and shadow puppetry performance for young people created by Hubbard Street 2 and Manual Cinema when I worked at Hubbard Street Dance Chicago about 10 years ago. It was titled Mariko's Magical Mix, and we have a short behind the screens video that I'd like to share as the first of many visual aids for our conversation today. So can we roll that video? I should also mention that I was not the originally intended moderator for today's conversation. Um, Karen Brown, who directs the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Chains, it, Change, is unfortunately ill and not able to join us today, but I'd like to thank her for her work to prepare for today's conversation about joy and resilience in puppetry. And I also want to share a video that she hoped would frame our event today. So first I'm gonna share some of her words about that video. This short clip is from Moving Mountains, the 14th production of the annual Berrydale Giant Puppet Parade, which takes place every year around Reconciliation Day, a day celebrating unity and peace among peoples in South Africa, and which for the past decade has been one of the leading puppetry events in South Africa. The annual Giant Puppet Parade and performance was originally created between the Handspring Trust for Puppetry Arts, the Center for Humanities Research at UWC, Netveer Pret, and the Magpie Arts Collective as a year-long process of aesthetic education in puppetry, research, and performance between rural and urban participants. Through the years, the annual parade and performance in Berrydale has brought together artists, scholars, researchers, and publics, not only from across Berrydale and Cape Town, but nationally and internationally as well, including artists and scholars from Minnesota. Moving Mountains takes the impulse of transforming spaces and spaces of transformation, of moving the immovable as its guiding thematic and creative concern. Through puppetry, movement, and music, something as immense as a mountain might be set in motion. It is said that to move a mountain is to attempt the impossible, but through this project, the artists attempt to question society and the many mountains it manifests. Through the creative art of giant puppetry, they ask, what mountains do we face today, and where do we wish to move them? Using puppetry and metaphor, the artists explore the psychic and physical landscapes and creatures of the mountains that surround the Trudeau Valley, raising questions about freedom and knowledge, ownership and justice, access and exclusion. This year's production showcases brand new puppet creations, including a giant leopard by Uquanda Puppet Company with whom Karen and her center work closely. These short excerpts will give you a feeling for the work.
So with thanks to Karen for that backdrop, the next thing that, that I will do is ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their own work. So we'll start with Steve Ackerman to my right. Uh, hi, I'm Steve. Uh, I use he, him. Um, so I, I got into puppetry when I was maybe like eight or nine. Uh, I was kind of influenced by like Pee Wee's Playhouse, um, puppets from that. Um, uh, and then I would just bug my parents to make little uh, puppet stages for me. Um, and then I would drag my mom to these puppet conferences where we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and then I, I put it by the wayside for a bit. Um, probably I went through like a goth phase in middle school, high school. And then um, in undergrad and then in grad school when I was writing some plays, I was like, oh, how can I possibly uh, do this stage direction? Um, I was like, oh wait, there's those puppet things I put by the wayside. Um, so then I moved to Minneapolis, partially because I knew of some puppet scene happening here um, in 2010. Um, and then I just started volunteering at Heart of the Beast um, and then like, a month into volunteering, they gave me a key to the building. They were like, <laughs> they were like you can come inside. So, um, and then I've been working there for about 14 years now. Thank you, Steve. Sophia Padilla and Ruben. Hi, everybody. Um, well, puppets for me were a um, beautiful coincidence. I went to the acting conservatory in Mexico City, that is where I'm from, and I was kind of tired of actors, to be honest. <laughs> and um, randomly, a puppetry company from Cuba was making um, auditions, and I didn't know anything about puppetry in that time, but I was really interested and it opened this whole new world to me and for some reason with no experience after the audition they took me in and I was traveling and working with them for seven years after that and it really changed my whole world and um, I'm very happy to be here in the Twin Cities now. Um, in May is going to be three years that I live here and uh, my connection to this country uh, in puppetry started with Bread and Puppet Theater. I came to be an apprentice and um, and that's, you know, um, Bread and Puppet Theater, it's uh, one of the oldest companies in this country and they are activists and they've been around since the 60s and they do like giant puppets and um, 
and they were kind of the seed, like Sandy Spiller, who founded Heart of the Beast, um, was a puppeteer at Bread and Puppet in the 70s, and then she came back here and founded the Heart of the Beast. So I, it's, it's a seed that comes from Bread and Puppet Theater, and because of that connection, I ended up um, here uh, living in the Twin Cities. Um, Sophia, I don't want to interrupt, but yeah. I wonder if we could show some of the photos of Bread and Puppet Theater that we also Oh have. yeah, that would be great. So you can see a little bit. If you are not um, familiar with their puppetry, Peter Schumann um, is the director, is going to be 90 years old in June. And he still bakes the bread at five in the morning, uh, paints the puppets, uh, directs the company, writes, um, coordinates music. It's like pretty pretty inspiring and incredible to work with them. Um, I've been working seasonally uh, with them for many, many years, and I still go. I try to be summer staff and be part of their shows and bring my kids with me to be part of it. Um, yeah, so for example, this is like a protest uh, they did, I think, for Vietnam. That's Peter Schumann, the, di the director, with a loaf of bread that he baked. Um, <laughs> And yeah, these are some of the photos of the shows. That's a 2016 one in the summer. They do like a big circus in their property at Vermont. Um, they travel the whole world. This is like a show, I think, maybe in El Salvador with one of their puppets. Um, they are a really important company internationally. And yeah, they do amazing um, work. They used to live in New York. Um, and then they moved to this farm in Vermont in Glover, Vermont, that is a tiny town in the middle of nowhere. And they do these shows throughout the summer every weekend, and they do like circus and pageants and indoor shows, and they have a gallery and a museum with the old puppets from all these years. And it's pretty amazing and remarkable. They don't take any grants from the government, is one of the um, few examples of companies that want to survive by themselves, um, just by touring and making shows and making it accessible to everybody as well. So, and I met um, the co-director of my company at Bread and Puppet, and then we decided to found our company um, called Paradox Teatro, and um, he is from the Twin Cities and it has been working in puppetry here as well, and that's how we brought Paradox Teatro here um, from Mexico. <laughs> And some of the photos you were looking at are from that work where this guy, Ruben, is the protagonist of one of our shows. And it's a show about migrations, um, migraciones. We always use um, both languages, um, Spanish and English, f in our shows and few words. It's mostly image. Um, we do a mix of sand drawings and shadow puppetry. Um, yeah, and I feel like images can talk more of what I could explain about my work. So there's a little uh, trailer of that show. I was speaking about migrations that is one minute long and you can see a tiny, a tiny glimpse of what I do. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Juan Vu, you're up next. Hello. Yeah? Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Juan Vu, uh, she, her pronouns. And yeah, like uh, the video said, uh, oh, wait, yeah, like we said before, um, I'm a community organizer, uh, youth worker, and puppeteer. 
And I thought we could kick it off by watching a little video about my work. And there's like, there is something about that history and it's like worldwide um, importance and that it's still alive um, and it still can be practiced and taken seriously and used in powerful ways. I think telling stories can change people's minds and it can also change culture. It's far more interesting maybe like to watch a show, right? It's like you're being tricked into, yeah, seeing a different perspective that you may not have. Or maybe you're more amenable to it because like, again, a lot of the puppetry I use is, I try to use humor and I try to use music uh, to make things a little bit lighthearted and fun. Um, Cause I think people want to have fun and have joy um, while also being inspired to like, think about how we can change the world. Cause sometimes it's pretty grim um, when you try to change things and it takes a long time, right? And so like, how can we celebrate the little victories? Um, yeah, and stories offer an imagining of things in the way that we hope things to be. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. That's all I'm going to say. No. Uh, that was, yeah, that was produced by TPT. Um, and I thought it was a good kickoff to see a little bit of the work in action. Um, but I have a background in youth work. Uh, and uh, community organi organizing, like I said, um, just because my parents are immigrants and they're like, you better do something and make money, otherwise you'll be on the streets. And I was like, good point. Uh, so yeah, I yeah I ha I work at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Um, I've worked there for 15 years, and I work in a program um, supporting young people to learn media and technology to address social justice issues. Um, and I think that work's super important. And I also have done a bunch of community organizing work, whether it was working with a group called Minnesota 8. And they support folks who are facing, Southeast Asian folks in particular, facing deportation. Um, so I was with that group um, when they were just starting as just folks supporting um, their loved ones um, facing those conditions um, and volunteered with them for a really long time. Um, and now I'm super involved and active in my workplace uh, just because we just got a union um, and that's pretty amazing, but it's a lot of work. Um, but all these things are, I think, ways to address like physical conditions of people's livelihoods. Um, and I think, yeah, again, as immigrants, we think about our physical safety oftentimes because we come from places where physical safety is not guaranteed by folks fled war, but also there's more to life than physical safety, right? And so I think for the longest time, I didn't have a chance to practice art. It was just like this fun thing I did on the side um, until I did a Monkey Bear uh, Harmelodic Workshop. And so with that, I was able to, you know, I was always doing art, but it like kind of just completely clicked because I liked telling stories and I just didn't understand. I couldn't do it through filmmaking. It was through physical puppets and theater and community. And because Chimindica was supporting such a, yeah, such a like, an, um, like a, yeah, a community with authenticity that I was able to like access that. And then also she continued to support a lot of us as puppeteers and realizing it could be a way that I could do things uh, and survive. So yeah, uh, that's how I got into puppetry. I'm just like, I feel so, 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 so lucky because it is, it is something I'm so passionate about and I'm so much happier because I get to practice art and I, I just couldn't do that because I was always thinking about people's physical conditions. Um, so yeah, that's, and that's a, a little bit about the work I do. Uh, and then I have some puppets I wanted to show. Um, so this is Chicken the Ghost. Um, yeah, so he is a part of a show called uh, Phantom Loss uh, that uh, is gonna be at Heart of the Beast this spring. And it, again, it's inspired by uh, my family's own immigration story of coming uh, to the US and fleeing violence and war um, and just like the, again, like the impacts of trauma of, and how do we deal with that? How do we deal with our pain? We can choose to be with the pain. We can choose to ignore it. We can choose to use substance abuse to try to like, uh, yeah, make it better. Uh, 
And so that sounds really heavy. And like I said, I don't, all, while these things are heavy, um, I don't always try to like focus on that. So I try to have fun with puppets. Uh, so it's, it's like this wacky game show and this girl who meets this ghost. Uh, this is uh, a puppet I made. This is Bao. <laughs> and he's like a Muppet style puppet. Uh, he, yeah, he does. He's very cute. Uh, and he was a puppet I made for uh, a series of conversations uh, around the Yes on Two campaign, which was trying to think about community safety in a way um, that wasn't just through policing. Um, and then I have this other puppet. I'll show you. Ugh. Uh, this is a little, yeah, thank you. This is a little bird puppet. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a bun. Uh, <laughs> and he is a bird that was trying to escape the zoo, but really he's trying to escape his pain which is so apparently seems to be a theme in my shows. <laughs> yeah, so those are my puppets. Uh, yeah, yeah. thank you, Juan, and welcome to Chaminda Wangaragala. Is this on? Yes. OK. Um, hi, my name is Chaminda Kawangaragala. I'm a um, Sri Lankan-American artist here in the Twin Cities. And um, I got my start through visual art. I, I've always loved puppetry, and um, I um, before show the video and pictures, I just wanted to quickly s say how I got inspired by puppetry. Um, and it's really about really the, the importance of the public sharing of art because I saw a puppet performance that the Walker Art Center had put on through their Out There series at the Southern Theater in 1996. And they brought all these puppeteers from New York City. And I had never seen anything like that. I had never seen something like that. The puppets, I believed they were alive because the performers were so amazing, you believed the puppets were alive. Like one of them was <clears throat> like this flower in a flower pot, like really huge. So one person was moving the head and one person was moving a stem and the other person was moving the other stem. And it was about this flower trying to escape this lab. It's kind of like the bird escaping the zoo, like try, trying to escape this scientific lab with, it and, and with its other plant friends, but like, you totally believed it was alive, even though it was this like fantastical creature. And I was like, oh my God, I want to do this someday <laughs> because it was just so powerful and you totally were transported into this other world. And it just reminds you of when you were a child and all of that seemed so real and, be and believable. And to be able to access that same feeling when you're an adult is, is a pretty amazing thing. And so, um, uh, but you know, I never really saw any workshops or anything when I looked out for them in the in the Twin Cities, and so, uh, so then in nineteen uh, no two thousand sixteen, um, uh, I ran into Andrew Kim, who got his start at Heart of the Beast, and um, he doesn't live in this country anymore. He's in the UK with his own puppet theater, but um, he's an amazing master puppet artist, and so I just had a did a GoFundMe campaign to bring him here to teach. Um, me and a whole bunch of other Native Black and POC folks, because while there was and is a, a large puppetry community in the Twin Cities, it was very white, and uh, not just here, but nationally too. And so I just really wanted there to be an opportunity for Native Black and POC folks to learn puppetry and to reclaim those cultural memories that exist in everybody's ancestry and, and it's still practiced all around the world. So, um, so yeah, so uh, if you could show the video first. Um, it's, these are clips from our intensive. So the way that, so yeah, so that's how I founded Monkey Bear's Harmelotic Workshop. And the first thing we do in it each year is to have a puppet performance intensive. Um, and in that intensive, uh, we bring Andrew Kim and he teaches uh, a group of folks, usually around 10 people, um, each day learning a different style. Um, yeah, if we could play the video, that'd be awesome. It, ha it has clips of the what happens in the intensive. Uh, where each day they learn a different style of puppetry. So shadow puppets, another day it's marionettes that Kurt Hunter actually teaches. Um, then another day masks, another day we have, um, uh, let's see, uh, rod puppets, tabletop puppets, hand puppets, glove puppets. And, um, and then um, whoever completes that intensive, they can be in our program that's called New Puppet Work. So uh, what I realized was Having workshops is great, America. but that doesn't mean I that then all of a sudden you know how to do a theater performance. And so you can turn the sound down. Let's, they can just see. Um, 
And um, so yeah, so workshops were great, but I realized it, that's not teaching the skill of learning of how to create a puppet theater piece. So uh, then started the program called New Puppet Works, where whoever completes that um, gets mentorship. It's like an eight month program where you learn how to create your own puppet theater piece. And so, um, so yeah, so like this year we have a cohort doing working now and each of them gets $4,000. They get like a ton of mentorship hours and workshops on how to create different styles of puppets. Um, and they get mentorship on, you know, creating their story and developing that. And um, that's Jonathan. His puppet is right here. Uh, that was from our sh uh, show in May at Pillsbury House Theater. So they go through the program and it culminates in a performance at Pillsbury House Theater where um, they present their first works of puppetry. Um, we do like a three night run. And, um, and been because they've done that then, they have a work sample, their first work sample of puppetry that they can then you know, apply to other puppetry opportunities in the Twin Cities. And Juan is really an amazing testament to what we do. Be yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because like, she's been doing so many amazing things in the Twin Cities puppetry community and in other arts organizations, like using puppetry, um, because she was able to get training through Monkey Bear and access that and then be, be able to access other opportunities. You know, and now she's the co-director of the Puppet Lab program at OpenEye and um, uh, Juan and Andrew Young, who was in our first year's cohort, uh, they are gonna be doing a residency at Pillsbury House Theater in May. Um, anyway, so yeah, so it's been really cool. I mean, my favorite part is going and watching everyone's shows after they've been in Monkey Bear and seeing everything that they do around the Twin Cities. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chimindika. Steve, I think we have some photos from Heart of the Beast too, if you'd like to talk through those. Do you wanna look at some images um, from your work too? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I think some that I sent in are from Heart of the Beast and then some are just kind of my my own work as well. Um, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. That's a, that was done at a residency in New London, Minnesota, just kind of giant cyclops that took up the whole theater space. <laughs> um, and then this, um, I was uh, fortunate enough to go with Karen, who was uh, supposed to be the, the moderator um, to South Africa to the Berrydale Festival in 2016 with another artist, Madeline Helling. Um, so we got to work with um, the grade school there and um, create that pageant that you saw in that previous video. And that was in 2016 and there was, um, that was the year of the elephant. So they created these three giant elephants that were incredible. It was the Yukonda puppets with handspring um, and then Madeline and I helped out. So those are the elephants. Um, and those were pretty hefty. All of the performers were like pretty gassed by the end of it. <laughs> but it was, I mean, like it's similar. You probably know handspring maybe from War Horse or they, they have brought a few, they brought a Wojciech performance I think to the Walker years, years ago. Uh, but you can kind of see that like caning uh, method that they do for their structures and everything, which is pretty incredible. Um, but it, that festival kind of mirrors um, similar to like the Bare Bones Festival or, or, or May Day in terms of it being this big community effort to then put on this giant parade and, and show. Um, yeah, so those were some of the kids getting ready. They're actually wearing electric fence electric fence helmets to kind of keep in the elephants. So we made those with the kids. Um, that's just another show from Heart of the Beast. Um, yeah, and then there's just more random shows. <laughs> that we. Uh, yeah, and that was a show I did with Janata Petrus and Harry Waters at Heart of the Beast in 2021, 20, I think called Impact Theory of Mass Extinction. Oh, and that was just a random show about heck and devils and a guitarist. <laughs> um, oh, and then this was a parade that I did in September 
with a bunch of artists um, also in New London, Minnesota. Um, there's an artist, Bethany, who works at the, the Little Theater there. Um, we had worked on a residency previously, and she was like, oh, I want to have a puppet parade in our small Minnesota town. Um, so it was me and a, a whole bunch of artists went out there in August and September of this past year and kind of in a similar kind of um, bare bones, Mayday-esque uh, vibe. We got together with the community and then made a whole bunch of puppets and then paraded down the street and had a uh, kind of a show on the water in canoes. That was a little chaotic, but fun. <laughs> and that's just a random wrestling puppet show. That seems good. All right. <laughs> Thank oh, you all. Oh, so, oh, sorry, that, that last one. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so that was, that's the parade that we did in New London. So that's a shot of the parade coming down the street there. Well, thank you all for, for bringing those videos and those images. And I think that one of the things that we can see is that puppetry can mean so many different things and it can, it can find people in so many different ways. And I am interested to know, we, you've talked about this a little bit, but to, just to dig into the idea of what does puppetry mean to you and why did you choose it? So Chimindika, can we start with you? Yeah, um, I, I think it really goes to what I was saying about when I saw that performance is you're just brought into this other world and you believe that world is real. And I think that's an amazing feeling. And, um, and through Monkey Bear, what I what I've see is how some folks, because they're all artists from other disciplines that um, come in to learn puppetry, is sometimes some of the stories that they want to tell, they weren't able to tell in another art form, but somehow like, puppetry, it just clicks and they, and they're able, it like flows out and they're able to tell stories that, you know, were inside and, and couldn't, they couldn't get out before. So there's just something magical about it that, that just brings forth a lot. And, and I just, for me, the joy is just watching the puppets be alive. And so I just love, like for, for myself, like I don't actually perform. I, um, I love like coming up with story, making the puppets, and um, uh, but I like to direct because then I just get to sit there and watch it all happen, <laughs> you know. And even in, re and in rehearsal, just seeing the improvement and how much more alive the puppets are each time there's a rehearsal. So I just love seeing all that come to life. Uh, yeah, why puppetry? Did you say? Yeah, yeah, I think broadly speaking. Yeah, broadly speaking, uh, I think it's like low tech. I think that I'm really drawn to the low tech. I think, yeah, if you watch a movie, it almost seems like magic, like magic in a not fun way. It's like, oh, you know, you're just if you see special effects and all that, it's like, oh, you know that a computer is doing that, uh, and there's a human behind that computer doing those things. I don't want to cut those folks short, but it is something about like when you know, when you see this like puppet, right? It's like what is this paper mache and plastic, but somehow you're able to, like Chaminica talked about, make it come to life. Or when you see things like on Steve's show, in Impact Theory, you had this volcano erupting, but it was like pieces of fabric flying out of like, you know, a paper mache volcano again. I, so there's something about like the low tech, which is, it's just so fun to watch. Um, yeah, and I think there's something about like embodied physical theater so in order to tell a story like Chimenica is talking about when you're doing it yourself like stories come out of you and the ability to say things are, are, are very different so it, it feels better to like create art in this like very embodied way versus when I was doing filmmaking uh, yeah which was just yeah with the the technology I wasn't able to like express myself in a similar way Um, for me is um, many things. One of the things is that I feel like the puppetry community around the world is a very generous community. Um, so that definitely got me after being tired of the competitivity of um, the 
theater professional acting scene in Mexico City. So that was definitely something that drew me to it. And also I always um, say that uh, puppets can fly and actors cannot. <laughs> <laughs> And that's just incredible because, um, like, I I totally um, agree with what Chamindica and uh, Juan were saying um, about the low tech and puppets coming alive, and you can make this uh, magic happen. With um, I tell this to my students, like, you don't need thousands of dollars to produce an incredible, you know, puppet movie. You can do the same impact and you have the same power with you know 20 bucks of cardboard and paint um so i feel that's that's the magic of puppetry for me that um is very powerful to to tell stories um yeah i would say yes to all of that and i love the the low tech um answer um and the like the magic the puppets being able to just like defy gravity in a way or you can you can go to any place uh instantly or you know like fly transport different places um pretty much do anything you want with puppets which you know makes it unlimited in terms of possibilities um and then it just combines like so many other different art forms um, so it's kind of greedy in that way, where you can kind of like, it has like those theater elements, it has movement and dance, it has like the making of the puppets, so like sculpture and, and those visual arts as well. So it's just like being able to like combine everything um, into this one performance. And also like right, also right around when I was eight or nine, before that goth phase, I also wanted to be a magician too, and I feel like it does have that little bit of a magician aspect too um, that is like sleight of hand in a way of, um, yeah. And I feel like maybe I just have a face for puppetry so I can hide behind something <laughs> instead. So I think I feel like a lot of people maybe who are introverts can be like, oh, I'm going to run around in the dark and do shadow puppets instead. Juan, I'm going to come back to you to start us for the next question because you talked about embodiment. And I'm interested in the process of creating these puppets, but also thinking about how they're going to move when you're creating them. So can you talk a little bit about the, the process for creating for you? Yeah, um, I think there's different ways you can approach uh, uh, puppetry, making puppets. Yeah, like it's like art object come to life, right? It's a sculptural piece of art and you can move it. And so you can think about, uh, there's always the problem of like, how many hands do you have? It's two, but <laughs> so how can you, how can you get this puppet to do more with just two hands? Or can you get like, there's puppetry where um, you have uh, th like a, a single person, right? A, the, a figure and you get three people to move it. And there's like, one person just moves the head and one arm, and the other person moves the other arm and holds up the waist, and the other person moves the feet. Like, and you can do like hyper-realistic things like that. That's like a style of puppetry. Um, so you can think about movement in that way. Is like, how many hands do you have? Well, how much money do you have, right? Um, or you can do things that are more uh, mechanics. So um, yeah, so a lot of marionette puppets have lots of like strings attached to them. And so you can get multiple things moving. So I have a, wish I would have bought the bird puppet, but it doesn't, it didn't look pretty right now. But it's, you know, it's got some mechanisms to make the feet move and then make the wings move at the same time. So you have like one puppeteer, but you can have a lot of things moving. So like making things move makes it look lifelike. Um, and so we're always trying to think about that as puppeteers. How can you make it lifelike? Can you use mechanics? Can you use um, different performers? Um, yeah, that's sensitivity. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Does anybody else have anything they want to add about creative process and movement of puppets? Yeah. Um, I uh, was thinking about how sometimes you make a puppet and then you actually move it and then you realize that it's not the right puppet. So I think a lot of like creating puppets has to do with play and 
just moving the puppets with other people and and trying out scenes and like improvising to see if like if it's if if and and sometimes like moving them and playing with them can give you an idea of what that puppet like it's like then the puppet tells you who they are and that might end up helping you decide how what more you need to make on it like what you know maybe uh it needs a different kind of arm or a uh, different kind of head because it really does you know it has more of this kind of character to it um like i i brought these because um if you could you hold this yeah okay um i brought these because i wanted to show like the first thing that our the cohort learns to make is just a head on a dowel because you could use this head for like in lots of different kinds of puppet bodies and because like some of the artists that come through our program they, they're coming from other art disciplines that were making things with your hands is, is not needed so some of them haven't made anything with their hands since they were kids um, so maybe having a lump of clay where you have to carve a face seems intimidating but this is just newspaper inside newspaper that you build up and then this is also just adding more newspaper to build up that shape and then just one layer of paper mache and then painted so and then these are just cut out of the insulation material like that purple foam kind of stuff for houses um, again like all cheap material but now this head can go onto different bodies like this is a practice puppet so to l learn like three person manipulation where somebody's holding the head and one of the head so you can have it in this type of body which has a like, more complicated joint mechanics and stuff but then you can also have something like Sophia's character wearing that shirt so kind of that same concept where you have it in fabric in a, in a shirt or something and then you you're putting your your hand becomes the hands puppet um, and of course you know this would be this other arm would be covered up but basically you're you're able to pick things up with your own hand but that's the puppet's hand and um, so you can so if, if you feel intimidated by doing joint mechanics and stuff like you have your own arms that can be the puppet's arms so it's just a fun way to show people like how accessible it can be and then Juan actually did a workshop for our cohort learning how to make this type of body um, and it's just cart cardboard inside with like webbing um, connecting the different parts together and the head is just paper mache but you know um, Jonathan learned how to knit <laughs> like he had never knit before and he's like he really wanted a sweater for his puppet and I think what's really cool is like once you start making things you feel confident about trying other things that you might not know how to do so a lot of folks have developed more skills because you get that sense of confidence from having tried something new already and puppetry was new to everybody when they came to monkey bears so yeah, so it's just fun seeing how people, you know, learn so much through the process. Thanks for that. Steve, I'm going to come back to you and what you talked about in terms of imagination, because one of the subjects of our conversation today is around joy and resilience. And do you think that the imagination that is kind of inherent in puppetry kind of can help us imagine a world that could be more equitable or to show how joy shows up for, for different people? Like, how do you think imagination can help us make those kinds of connections in puppetry? Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think that's totally possible. I feel like that's how puppetry is used a lot, is trying to show, uh, or try to show a world that we, that we are striving to live in um, that is equitable. I think that you see that a lot in, in some of the bread and puppet um, that Sophia was showing, and some of like the the bare bones, and sometimes the 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 mayday of just showing those very impactful visuals that you see. Um, that um, I mean, there's some tools that are in like uh, in protests or in events where um, it's just the number of people or it's the voice of the people. Uh, but then sometimes when you're when you're able to bring those like very strong visuals to that as well um, and that just can kind of like make things pop in a way or be able to cross barriers in terms of language or whatever and you just see this one specific image um, that 
you know, like everyone knows, um, you see a, like a, a giant woman shrouded with her face in her hands, then you know that's trying to show grieving of some sort. So I think that's that's the power of, of puppetry in like in the streets that way of just being able to like um, kind of make that statement known um, and just kind of adding it to, you know, like those those large groups as well. Sophia, I'm gonna come back to you because you talked a little bit about the community that is present in puppetry and how it how it drew you here to Minnesota and also how you're a part of that community when you're with Brennan Puppet in, in Vermont. Can you talk a little bit just about how um how the community that you have become a part of like has developed and has shaped you as an artist? Yeah. Um it's pretty it's pretty incredible. Um, I mean, Bread and Puppet is a very old company, as I said, but like sometimes, you know, I got stuck, for example, in an airport once um, with my little kid. Well, he's not little anymore, but he was little then. And I couldn't, um, I was like, what do I do? Um, and um, I was on my way to a tour with Bread and Puppet and my second flight was canceled. And, and I was like, well, I guess there's probably a puppeteer that knows Bread and Puppet or that is related to the company here. And I, I like looked into the summer, um, you know, contact information and I found somebody and I called, um, the first person that I called was like, I'm on my way to the airport, I'll get you both. No worries, I'll bring you back tomorrow morning and you'll get on time for your tour. And just like, um, and puppeteers around the world really, um, I've, I've had this experience in different examples um, around the world with different puppet, puppeteers and puppet communities that um, it has been my experience that we are always um, willing to help each other and willing to share our tips. It's a very nerdy community, so <laughs> it's very it's it's kind of incredible that you know it has taken you so many prototypes and so many uh, failures of like you make one puppet and you, every, you have everything in your mind and when you're actually building it or trying it you're like oh no this doesn't work and you try different materials and you learn all these little tips um, with the years and the times you do it all over and over again, you fail and you do it again and you fail and you do it again until you find the right material or, or the right way of using certain materials. And then you go to a puppet festival or you, you know, grab coffee with one and you're like, so what do you use for this? Oh, you know, this is better. This use this kind of fishing line or like all these tips and really around the world, all the puppeteers I know, you can ask anything and they will tell you what they use. And that's just pretty amazing to me that, um, yeah, we just like help each other and try to, like the importance is on the art we do and we share and not in our pers person, like individuals. It's like more, uh, yeah, yeah. Does anybody else have anything they wanna add about community? Yeah, because um, Sophia mentioned how she was sick of the competitive actor community and um, there was someone in our cohort, there's someone in our cohort this year who went to acting school in New York City and after being done with school was, you know, trying to get opportunities there to act and everything and she was just so, she was so frustrated and disappointed at how competitive it was and just how difficult it was to have that sense of community there with the other actors because everybody was like competing for these roles and not sharing information. Uh, it was like the exact opposite of puppetry community. Um, but she uh, was in our intensive and is in our cohort now. And so she had decided to give up on pursuing her art because it was just such a bad experience for her. But I think, you know, seeing that there's other arts communities and, and that they don't, they don't have that sense of competition that everyone just wanting to help each other out. I think that really inspired her to keep trying. Um, and now she's gonna be you know, in LA trying to pursue her acting career still, but she's doing puppetry at the same time still. And so, um, but yeah, I think the sharing information and, and not feeling like, oh, I, I have to keep this a secret because 
I don't want this I, other people to know how to do this thing because this is my thing. Like there, it, there's just none of that, and and I really love that. Yeah, and it's also just the uh, it, the amount of puppet artists I think in like the Twin Cities is kind of insane, and I feel like it's maybe. I feel like I heard Liz say, Liz Howell say this once yeah. about like, you can't throw a puppet in South Minneapolis without hitting a puppeteer. <laughs> yeah, or something like that. Yeah, and so and it's and it's each each person has like a very distinct point of view or like aesthetic, where you're like, oh, that's that. You can just see a puppet. You're like, oh, that person made that or that that person made that, and then there's they just have like specialties. So it's like, oh, I want to make a marionette. I'm gonna go to Kurt, or I want to learn how to move with this puppet. Well, you should go to Masa and try try that. Or you want to make these giant, big animal puppets, uh, reach out to like Chris Lutter. Or just like, I don't know, there's like hundreds of artists who, in the just in the Twin Cities, where you're like, oh, you should go to this person. And if they don't know, I feel like they're so willing to be like, let's figure it out together. Um, and then also just the sharing of materials, I feel like is always huge, um, just because it's such a material-based art form that like, you know, like, oh, we need a bunch of cardboard, or oh, we need some paint, or we need this coax cable, random stuff that gets pulled out of the ground, where do we get that? And then, you know, you kind of just like can source it that way. One of the other things that we talked about when we were preparing for this conversation was how puppetry really is for people of all ages and it includes youth, it includes elders, and includes everyone in between. What do you think it is about puppetry that, that makes it so inclusive across generations in that way? Um, I, I really do think it is because we've all been a child. And when we were little, we took objects and brought them to life. And that was play every day. And so it's, it's when you see that as an adult, it, you, you remember that. And so it's not something weird or, um, you know, unknown. It, you, it's like goes back to the very heart of you being born and living and observing and playing. And so I, I really think that's why um, it, it connects with, you know, all, all sorts of, you know, from little kids to someone who's 80 something like we've had we've had multiple generations in our cohorts like there uh there was Keegan who at that time I think was in her late 30s and then some years later her mom was in our cohort you know and so it was it's it's yeah definitely it connects with everybody I'm waiting just in case anybody else has anything to add to that question before we move on uh, I, mean, I think also just in the in the making of things, uh, there's connection. I feel like a lot of these puppets take longer than most people think. Um, and for a lot of the larger ones, uh, there's just many hours of paper mache and something. Um, and then, you know, if it's a community-based project, you know, like people of all ages are coming to that and you're just paper mache with someone else um, who you don't know, you've never met, and you're just paper macheing for hours with them, um, and then there's that connection made in, just in the making of, um, yeah. All right, well, we're gonna start to transition into the audience Q&A portion of today. So, um, so I invite everyone, both in the room and on the Zoom, to go to Slido, um, and I think that we have a slide for that, and we can probably also put some information in, in the chat about how to get there, so you can add your questions. And while people are putting in their own questions, my last question, which is another something that, that we had talked about in our preparations for this conversation, were like, we think, we hope that people are gonna be excited about like getting involved and, and how do I get into making puppets? So, um, so I would love to give each of you, if you want to, the opportunity to share opportunities that you know about to, to get into it. Juan, we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you yeah, have anything? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to say that uh, a program for um, emerging puppeteers is something that I help run called uh, uh, Puppet Lab. 
So it's out of Open Eye Theater. So if you're interested in, um, in that, um, check it out. Um, but also there are, uh, there's something called Full Moon uh, Puppet Show, and it also runs out of Open Eye. So a lot of these, they're called cabarets. So they're like, it's just a chance for you to make something with a deadline, um, and it's just short, quick, and dirty. Uh, and it generally, we it tries to catch a lot of different types of folks, um, but there's the Full Moon Cabaret that happens at Open Eye. Um, there's usually the, the puppet cabarets that happen at Heart of the Beast, but cabarets are a great way to do something um, when you're just starting out. And then I know a lot of these places, uh, as part of their programming, have workshops. So Chicago Puppet Fest, they have online workshops um, that are pretty affordable. Um, yeah, and then I know, I guess I'll let Steve talk about you know Heart of the Beast and a lot of the things that you have too. Um, yeah, we, uh, we'll, we'll do different types of, uh, like school and community residencies. Some of those are just with, uh, the students of the school, but then some of, some of them are public based and we're always looking for people to come by and make puppets together, um, which is always great. And then, yeah, I would second any of like, there's usually always like a, a cabaret in formation and I think um, speaking as a curator of one and then knowing the other people who are curating those is there is not a necessity for you to have ever made a puppet show to apply. Um, in fact, it's kind of encouraged um, if you've never made a puppet show. Um, um, and then, the oh my God, thank you. The <laughs> Heart of the Beast also has uh, the Puppet Library, which is open the first and third Saturdays. Um, and that's just a, a wealth of puppets that we have over many, many years, many, many hands grading um, for people to come and um, use. Um, yeah. Can you check them out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can uh, check them out. I think it's like a two-week very lenient <laughs> rental period. Um, but people, like uh, school teachers have come and they're like, oh, I need a rabbit for this story time. Do you have a rabbit? And we're like, oh my god, yes we do. Um, and then they <laughs> they go and they take that, yeah. Um, and then there's just a lot of, there's always puppet shows in as well. So if it's not wanting to apply for something, I think going to see. Yeah, as, there's as also Z puppets. Z puppets, yeah. Yeah, on Chicago and there are studios there, but they do performances and workshops too. And um, and if you're native black or POC or know someone who is that might be interested in trying it out, um, if you go to the monkeybear.org website, um, you can learn more about us and you can contact me through that and um, uh, learn more about what we do and when we might have some offerings. And I would like to add that um, the Bread and Puppet Theater has an apprenticeship that also doesn't require any puppetry experience. And you kind of just jump in the work of the company. There are some apprentices that are, apprenticeships that are like two weeks or there's like a month long. There are like different options. You have to send a letter. I think the deadline is March 1st. Um, so in case you're interested in that. And there's also the Bare Bones community that last year I was uh, very honored to co-direct the show. And it was like my first time I mean, I've, I've performed at Bread and Puppet many times, but I've never directed a show with giant puppets before. So it was like an amazing, challenging, amazing experience. So, um, and it's all made by volunteers. So that happens um, around September and October. And there are lead artists that um, kind of lead each section, but then everything is built and performed by volunteers. Uh, so this year, last year, it was like 200 people involved, volunteers. Um, so check out their website, bourbonspuppets.org, uh, um, also if you want to plug in. And like Steve said, um, if you're not into, if you don't want to jump into shows as a puppeteer or start that art form, you can also support um, all the puppetry shows that are going around like one show at the end of March, beginning of April at Heart of the Beast. Um, the Puppet Lab cohort will be that we are co-directing together this year. 
um, will have their shows in April at OpenEye, and there's always like a wide variety of puppet shows in the Twin Cities, like we said. Um, I, I always say this, um, that the puppetry community in the Twin Cities is probably the same size that the Mexico City one, but Mexico City has 22 million people. <laughs> so per capita, you have more puppeteers here. <laughs> I forgot, yeah, we are, our cohort's um, culminating performance is in May at Pillsbury House Theater, um, 23rd through the 26th, which is actually the same time that Juan and Andrew are doing their residency there. Yeah. So. I was also going to say, I, I remember my first experience with puppetry was coming to Heart of the Beast and doing community builds, so, and then same with Bare Bones. So if you want to get into puppetry, come to the community builds because they need ser your support and it's a good way to learn and, and be around those folks. Yeah. There's one in Midtown, see? Yeah. And then the puppet, puppet uh, library has workshops. I think last Saturday there was a shadow workshop that Erica uh, Warren and Jonathan Boyd led, uh, who are monkey bear alums. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into some beautiful questions that we have from our audience. And the first one is, how do you make the puppet come alive as opposed to simply moving the puppet? <laughs> There's a request for we some might need a puppeteer and a talker. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think the I'll start with the like a philosophy that I was taught at Sandglass Theater, which is this place out in um, Vermont, is that you it's it's not like you, you manipulating the puppet and making it do what you want to do isn't going to work because puppets are built in a certain way, right? When we were talking about creative process, uh, the other night we got this prompt, which was make the audience feel as uncomfortable as possible <laughs> was our prompt. And it was so, and you have these like preconceived ideas of what stories you might want to tell, but sometimes that's thinking from up here versus like just what comes out in your subconscious. And so, to be a good performer, you really it's really about like being embodied and being in the moment. And so you're always trying to think about just it as an extension of you. And so you're, an exercise we're always given is like, take in the scenery first. Like, what is the puppet looking at? What is the world it is looking around at? And when you are thinking about the world that your puppet is in and you're thinking about that purses versus that puppet is doing versus controlling it and moving it around, like the performance is gonna be much more lifelike. Um, so that, I always try to think about that, but sometimes I go into panic mode and I'm like, I have to move the puppet in this way. And <laughs> yeah. You know. And I would add that it's also a lot about breath and yeah. transferring emotions to the object or putting the emotional weight on the object that you would have if you were an actor. Um, but it's a lot about finding the rhythm of finding the rhythm of actions and emotions into an object, I would say. Focus. So we always talk about focus. So like where is your puppet always looking? Um, and you always have to think about like puppets are simple creatures, so one thought at a time. So <laughs> yeah, so it's like, okay, if I was gonna have this puppet come onto stage. I have to, you know, my sight line's up here, so look at you all first. And then, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the left, so I'm gonna look left, and then I'm gonna move it. Yeah, so it's, you know, like, performance is much more exaggerated, just like a lot of physical performers do, like clowning or, um, yeah, perform, yeah, puppets have to be a little bit more simple and exaggerated. Yeah, almost like mask work as well. Like, you have to be very intentional of every little detail in a puppet, so you can't be, like, messy and fast. You usually have to be very intentional and break it in parts, so you look first with the puppet and then you go, or you look first and then you grab it, or breaking it down, kind of. What's the most magical puppet moment you've ever had as an artist or audience member? Um, I was at Open Eye. Uh, Joshua Holden um, from New York was performing, and it was a sock puppet. But like, 
he had this voice for this character. The character's name was Nicholas. And it was a sock with like a yogurt container for the mouth part, but he had sewn it in a way that like, I mean, it really had this like expression. And so he and it had a rod for the bottom of the sock part and then it, another rod for the arm that was sewn onto it. And oh my God, like you just totally believe the sock puppet was alive and it interacted with him, the puppeteer. So they were actually like a duo. Um, and he did such an amazing job. And so at the end of the performance, I went up to him to, you know, thank him for such an amazing, I just started bawling like, <laughs> and all these other people in the audience were there waiting to like talk. And I just, I was like, oh my God. I was like ugly crying. I was like, oh my God, it was so amazing. I was just like, and I'm sure he was like, who is this person? But like, it was so powerful because like, you just really believe it was alive and like, yeah, just, just a lot of emotion. <laughs> so. I was gonna say, I just went with Sophia to see one of her students work at McAllister and it was somebody who is new to puppetry and it was honestly like the most amazing, one of the most amazing puppet experiences I've had because you're always asking the question, why puppetry? So like there's a million art forms, like why this story, why puppetry? And I think one of the things about puppetry is like, materials is a big deal. So this this was, what they did was it was, and the, the title was like, you know, the title was called P Puppet Divorce, like part two, and I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I was like, that's a kind of a goofy uh, title, but the, the show was, the, it was just like a two minute piece, and it was three people on this puppet made out of paper, and you heard this like loud arguing, it was clearly like a couple arguing, and that kept getting louder and louder and the puppet was like breathing and reacting and it was so scared. And then you heard the door slam and as the door slammed, the puppeteers, they all had each hand on the puppet, ripped apart the puppet and the lights went out. Yeah, and it's like, it was like that, that moment of that, yeah, it's just like, it felt like such a destruction to have these like caregivers in your life, right? They're like, not that the divorce has to be like that, but that was, it was such an emotionally powerful moment. And I think that's what I meant to say earlier is when you ask the question of like imagining is that I think what, when we're talking about art is like, what can art do um, in terms of political activism that, that other things can't. And so like the big thing with community organizing. So I was like, if you door knock on people's doors, and I was like door knocking on people's doors to talk about community safety, and the question that we had to ask them wasn't like, if you're trying to convince people to like look at alternatives beyond policing, you don't say like, you don't start like rattling off statistics about crime, because I thought that was it. I was like, dude, do you understand? Like crime is a lot lower. We don't need heavy, heavy policing. You ask them the question, you ask them stories and ask them questions to think about their own lives and you ask them to tap into emotions. And so I think that's what art does is that it can tap into like emotional experiences like that experience that I had <laughs> with that puppet being torn apart, right? Because those are the things that are going to move us and are going to help us create and imagine a different world um, more than like potentially facts are going to. So, sorry, that was a long answer for what you asked. <laughs> well, we have another question that I think ties into that, and I'd love to hear some other responses about, are there certain kinds of stories that you think either work really well or work badly for puppetry? I think all stories are valid and can be amazing with puppetry if they are done right. <laughs> Um, there is something universal about what you were just saying, one of like how we relate emotionally um, with puppets. And I, this is my personal theory that you don't have to agree with, but I, I think the audience members relate differently to puppets than to actors in the way that with an actor, that's, there's always like a layer of judgment of like, oh, you are pretending to be this thing. But with puppets, we are just immediately um, kind of agreeing into this convention of entering the fiction with the puppets, so we're not questioning or judging. So I feel like you are emotionally more open to whatever the story is. And I feel that um, that's why puppetry can be so emotionally powerful and 
it's the starting point is recognition, right? We recognize ourselves into the emotions of the scene or the puppet, and that recognition is going to make us maybe change our minds or just feel connected in a different way. Any other comments about stories that you particularly like to tell using puppetry? Uh, I mean, I would just reiterate what Sophia said about, um, I feel like all shows should have puppets in them, <laughs> selfishly. I feel, like, I feel like I've gone to a few where there's just these human actors on stage, and then halfway human, through, human theater. Um, I'll, I'll maybe, yeah, I'll maybe nudge my partner and I'll be like, where are the puppets at, or something. So, um, selfishly, I want them in everything. I know we need to maybe justify why we're using it. Um, but yeah, I, f I feel, I, this goes back to the other question, um, is I, I, I love the more like fantastical, like over the top things. And when you had asked about like uh, um, a powerful puppet moment, there was, um, Masa did this uh, really small piece for a cabaret that I was doing and he's done a few um, shows and performances, I think around Godzilla because of his connection to Japan. But there was one where um, he had he had made like a 22 foot long Godzilla that he had like painted like in an accordion style um, just of cardboard um, and he just he did this Butoh dance up to it um, and it had been like folded on the ground so you couldn't tell what it was and he just had this like this noise band playing um, and he, he started like, doing this very slow movement towards it and then I don't know how he did it because it, it had to wait like a lot and he just like lifted up the whole Godzilla like very slowly until it like got to the, to the very top of our lighting grid, which is like around like 22 to 25 feet or whatever. So he was just like holding that up. So yeah, I don't think you could do that with just a human, so. Yeah, I, I think. You so have I to stack them on top of each other. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with what everyone's saying that. It's a little precarious. Any story can be good for puppetry. I think it's more about well, which style of puppetry is right for that story? And, and you know, you'll see like multiple styles in one piece because of whatever ha is happening in that narrative. So I think it's about thinking about like what you want to use in the, in the piece. Although I will say I did watch a two and a half, to th I think it was two and a half hour uh, Hamlet puppet show. Oh, and I, <laughs> I, I, unfortunately I did not think it was the right, I didn't think it was right. Yeah, it was maybe it was the kind of puppetry that was used. It's true. <laughs> You're right. Maybe it was the kind. It could work with shadow, maybe. But it was there was too many words, and I think yeah, I think yeah, puppets are physical objects. So I think they're really successful when they are telling a story visually and with the physics of it, of their like physical nature. So I think that generally works well, and they tried to do it. It was you know you try you try. Sometimes yeah, it I work. really I really agree with that in that like. There's nothing wrong with having words in puppetry, yeah. but you have to think about the performance at the same time. Otherwise, the puppet becomes dead, and it's all about the dialogue and the words. But if, you, if you're a really great performer, then, and you're having to do dialogue in it, you are constantly thinking about your focus. You're, you're not just talking and then holding the puppet still. You're, you're like, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, you're, you have to think about like, the puppet taking a breath and turning its head even when, like just having it still and not moving at all, it just makes the puppet dead. So if, if this character is listening to another character, you still want them to react to whatever the other character is saying or, so if you don't, if you don't keep that puppet alive, then you know, it, you've just completely lost the whole point of puppetry. I found another question I love. Sophia, do you want to say something first? Um, yeah, sure, really quick. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking about what was the like most magical moment in like as an artist. And I, with this show, Migraciones, um, there's with this time, we always open up like a conversation with the audience after. Um, the first show we did was actually at Open Eye in uh, 2019. So it was open here, um, the first show, but um, so in these conversations with the audience after the show, every show, like some people will like share their own 
um, you know, grandparents' migrations or their own migrations experiences. And that was like, it has always been pretty amazing. We, we did it like in the US, in Mexico, in Europe, and in all the places there was always people, you know, willing to tell you their own stories about their own migrations. And that it's like, was such a gift. But I remember this particular girl in Mexico that um, came to me and um, there's, a, there's a scene of a truck with people inside in the desert. And she came to me and she was crying at the end of, of the show. And she was like, you know, my, my dad did that for me. And my dad was in a truck like that for me and like to send me money so that I could go to college and um, have a better opportunity in life. And um, just that sharing of, of, of that experience and memory, um, yeah, I just remember her face a lot and think about her and her story a lot. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I think that my next favorite question will probably end up being our last question. And we have a, a guest who says that your puppets seem to be extensions of yourselves. How do your families and friends interact with puppets? Um, I'm actually really jealous of my husband because he is a better puppeteer than me. <laughs> like, he, he just naturally, without even taking a workshop, can bring, like, an inanimate object to life. Because he's, he's been, he always does it for when our, like our kids were little, he would take the stuffed animals and bring them to life. Um, so he was actually in our first intensive. Um, he didn't want to create a piece after it, but he was in the intensive and like, he was just so good, like automatically. <laughs> so, so yeah, so he, he definitely loves puppetry and my, uh, my kids too, they got into shadow puppetry for a bit and we're always cutting out shadow puppets and stuff. But um, my family, like my mom's been to every single show, my, younger brother and my sister-in-law. Um, so yeah, everyone's been really supportive. My parents didn't love the theater life for me at the beginning. I, I started doing theater as an actor when I was 14, so it was like pretty young. And it wasn't their favorite um, choice. Uh, but you know, with all these years and now with puppetry, I feel like now they love it. Um, and my son has grow up with it. And, uh, you know, he has toured many times with me. And sometimes um, when he's on tour with us, we just add a little something in the show so he can have a role and get him to work and be inspired instead of being annoyed and bored. Um, so he has performed in, in many shows with Bird and Puppet or with Paradox Teatro. And um, I love to tell this little anecdote. When he was five, we were doing this cross-country tour with Bread and Puppet, and he was opening the circus, and he will be, he didn't even speak English yet then, and he w was opening the circus in Spanish. And he was like, in most of the acts, he was jumping in. I did um, replicas of the big puppets in little, like a little grasshopper and a little cloud so that he could hold them and they wouldn't be too heavy. And um, and you know, this puppeteer, we, we had this very long bus rides between cities. And um, in one of those bus rides, one of the puppeteers asked him, when in, asked him, you know, Iñaki, so uh, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Are you gonna be a puppeteer? And he, and he was five and he turned to him and said, me? I am already a puppeteer. <laughs> 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 so. Uh, yeah, he's a puppeteer, and you know I try to give him space as well. When he, when some weekends when we see too many shows, he's like, "Mom, I'm not gonna go to this show. It's like too many puppets." So I'm trying to give also some space so that he can, he, you know, won't get too tired of it. But um, yeah, I th I think I'd mentioned my uh, both of my parents are math teachers, and my sister was an accountant, so I think they were maybe originally like, oh, but what are you gonna do for a real job? So, but um, they've always been super supportive since I was really young. Um, and I may not really have that many like friends, uh, but like anytime that I, anytime that I wanna like hang out with people, I'm usually like, oh, I'm gonna do a puppet show and then I'm gonna 
bring the people that I want to be friends with into the cast, and then it's like a way of tricking them into being <laughs> friends. So that's, yeah. Yeah, my family's pretty supportive. Uh, I think during my last show, my dad was c like recording my show while he was watching it, and my mom kept having to like tell him to stop recording. <laughs> I, they thought it was really weird at first. They thought it was super weird because, uh, yeah, it is uh, to some people who are not familiar with it. But generally, yeah, folks are supportive. I'm always like imitating my dog, so it's just really an extension of <laughs> like a puppet show. So yeah. there was um. Someone in last year's cohort who had never invited their parents to anything they had done, um, and so this was their, you know, first time doing puppetry, and they invited them to the show, and they, well, first time for their parents to come to any creative thing that they've done, but also first time that they told them that they were proud of them, like after seeing the show. So it was like, yeah, a really touching moment. Well, I'm going to make a small plug, and then I'll invite each of you um, kind of going down the line to either share an up next or a last thoughts. Um, and so I'll just mention that we here at Northrop next Thursday night have Manual Cinema, a shadow puppetry company from Chicago. They're coming. They're doing their production, Ada Ava, and it's a, a special version of it that is orchestrated for organ. So it will be accompanied on the Northrop organ, and uh, in the Heart of the Beast, we'll be in the lobby doing some puppetry and also some, some make and take. So so we're excited to have them with us. And um, Steve, you're up next. Um, I, I mean, I would just say, like I earlier, go see puppet shows. But I also encourage everyone to make their own puppet show. I feel like there's enough programs in the Twin Cities. I mean, similar like with Monkey Bear, where it's like artists who are maybe coming, you're maybe coming from a different art discipline. Um, and you're bringing that to the table, but like there's all of these different programs um, that are available, and I would just highly suggest making your own puppet show. Um, yeah. Yeah, and like uh, one said, a great way to do that. There's uh, puppet coverets here, but also like internationally and nationally, you can also you know make your do your do your piece online in puppet coverets around the world. So that's a great way of uh, working in something small. And then maybe that will be the first rock on your, you know, path of, um, of puppetry life. Who knows? It's what's up next for us? Or it, what, what is up next for you? Or any last thoughts that you'd like to share today? Oh, uh, come see Phantom Loss at Heart of the Beast Theater uh, this spring. Just go to the website. Uh, it should be either, yeah, likely end of March, beginning of April. Um, yeah, and yeah, puppets are awesome. They're fun. They're playful. Yeah, if you want to have fun, do puppets. I don't know. <laughs> is your puppet film that you made for... Minnesota Opera is that online on YouTube? Yeah, it is. If you look, it's at, really beautiful. Yeah, um, it's called Chimlac, C H I M uh, L A C. So yeah, that's a puppet film I made with Andrew Young and Charlie McCarran. Um, and then I have this dog puppet show, A World Without Police, A World with No Need for Police. That's also on there too. But yeah. Um, well, we have a show coming up in May at. Uh, Pillsbury House Theater, the cohort is presenting their work. They're working on their pieces right now. Um, and I also want to suggest if um, if you haven't seen that much puppetry, in addition to stuff locally, um, my way of finding out about what was going on in puppetry all these years was YouTube and just so I could see what, what was happening, you know, the other like Native Black and POC puppet artists like uh, and internationally too. So um, I discovered, I feel like that's how... I became good at puppetry was just watching a lot of work and um, and it's really great to see stuff happening like all over the world. Well, Chimindica, Juan, Sophia, Steve, thank you so much for sharing everything that you did today. Thank you all for joining us. It was really great to have you here and everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.